Hey, everybody. Thanks for having us at uh, SmartCon. We're, we're super excited to present. Uh, I'm Van Spencer, and this is Michael Anderson. We're the founders of, of Framework Ventures. Um, we're early investors and supporters of the Chainlink uh, project. Um, you know, we're soon to be active node runners uh, in a variety of interesting ways that we can kind of get into later in the presentation. But uh, in this presentation, we basically wanted to cover you know, our thesis of this space, how that interrelates to Chainlink, you know, where we are kind of both in, you know, the life cycle of this industry and where we see it going, uh, and also just some of the interesting things we see happening in D5. So our, our thesis is basically threefold. You know, it is, number one, finance is the world's largest industry. You know, number two, most of these financial products, you know, run inside of large institutions, there's been a complete lack of innovation in finance for the past 30 years. And the reason that is, is because there's no real developer sandbox. If you want to create a consumer application, you can go to the iOS app store. You can get your uh, app on test flight. You can distribute to thousands of users and boom, you have a consumer app that's out there in the market. For finance, there, there really hasn't been that same developer sandbox until today. You know, if you try to create a new financial product, you'd have to go to an investment bank or a prime broker like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and ask them for effectively permission to do so. Uh, but today, what DeFi is and what blockchain is and, and what Chainlink is, it is you know, composable pieces of infrastructure that any developer anywhere in the world can leverage to create new and innovative financial products. And you know, the, the reason that matters is because when things get 10 to 100 times cheaper, you know, innovation naturally explodes. You can see this in the revolution in, in servers. You can see this in the revolution of the iPhone platform, uh, allowing consumer apps to be easily distributed, but, but this is a huge deal. So, you know, why, why finance and, and why is this important? So if you look back in, at, at the internet and the way it developed, you know, in, in 1985, it was you know, relatively siloed. So, you know, information was held in universities, uh, you know, siloed TV programs, radio programs, news, books, libraries, it was, it was relatively siloed. And then came the World Wide Web and the, you know, low level standards that the, the World Wide Web ran on uh, eventually developed into cloud computing, open source movements, which eventually built the architecture and the foundation for social, mobile, local applications that really kind of, you know, had this step change in terms of developer activity, you know, mind share of consumers, and then eventually a product market fit. For finance, this is effectively the same thing that we see today. You know, over the past 30 to 40 years, there's been almost no innovation in finance. Uh, and, and right now in blockchain technology, you know, 2010, we kind of established the, the base case for blockchain and crypto with, with Bitcoin. Um, in 2017, you know, we had the ICO boom. And then 2018, 2019, we've kind of slowly progressed into uh, things that are composable, things that are interesting, you know, developer tools, being able to build a synthetic asset or build a borrow lend platform or write an insurance company with a few lines of code. And, and this is a huge explosion in terms of creativity and developer interest that is bringing a ton of sharp minds into the space. It's bringing a ton of capital into the space. You know, people are noticing the wins that are happening and it's bringing just a ton of mind share, which is incredible. And, and you know, these are things, this is a revolution that's gonna take probably decades to happen, but when it does, it, it's gonna be extremely powerful. And so, you know, why is this happening right now? Why is this important? You know, a lot of these things seem like toys. Um, and, and in some way, you know, the product market fit is limited. Uh, you know, we're, we're just at the early stages of really seeing what this stuff can do. But, you know, it's undeniable that instead of having, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in years and, and having to negotiate with traditional financial services providers to create new financial products, you know, anybody today, you know, someone like Andre can go on the internet, issue a token, get community distribution of ownership of the platform and start to build interesting strategies that help people effectively have a hedge fund or a yield farm right in their pocket. And that's something that really hasn't ever been seen before. And I think that, you know, as that progresses, you'll see, you know, things get more and more complex. The UX will get more and more developed. People will get more and more used to using these types of products. And this will in turn just drive more developers in this space. And so again, you know, why now? This is because we're building on two years and a ton of capital that flow into the space about, you know, in 2017. And that has just built this tooling, this infrastructure um, that has kind of put us where we are today. And so, you know, smart contracts and what smart contract con is basically about for us, 
you know, the building blocks of this new developer sandbox for finance. You know, you can use Ethereum for your compute later. Great. You, know, you can use Chainlink for your oracles. And, and as that Oracle network gets more robust, there'll be more types of data and more abilities for, for developers to create more types of uh, financial products. That's great. You know, wallets it represent the first truly global way to distribute um, access to these applications that is outside of a, a technology gated solution like the iOS app store or the Google Play Store. And then, you know, the fourth thing, which I think Chainlink does a uniquely good job at is, is cultivating and distributing internet native culture, um, whether that's the Link Marines, whether that's the Synthetic Spartans, you know, this is a movement that's born of internet native culture and that is a huge asset and it's really early. And as that translates, uh, you know, to a large market, that just has incredible benefits as well. So <clears throat> now what we want to do is go back in time uh, to just a few years ago and discuss a couple of the iterations that we think are notable uh, in terms of where this industry has come and, and where we think it will go in terms of the iterations of smart contracts as it relates to finance. And so what we really saw with smart contracts, <clears throat> which started in 2016 and, and ran through 2017, it could be s summarized as just tokenization. Uh, the basic process was taking investment dollars, putting them into a smart contract that was built on top of Ethereum, uh, and out came a series of tokens for that investment, which then were used in the network that people were investing in. And we all remember this, uh, for those that were around at least, this was the ICO craze where uh, hundreds of millions of dollars was able to be raised just through putting up some smart contract and, and telling people to send money to an address. Um, what we also saw was that this was the primary form of funding for all of blockchain development uh, and the capital formation method uh, that was really unique for blockchains and subvertive to the traditional venture capital funding cycle. Um, where ICOs were actually, by and large, the primary funding source in lieu of venture capital uh, for these new blockchain native applications. Uh, and so, you know, right now, where, where Michael and I view where we are today is that this movement will probably take 20, 30 years to fully play out. But at the end of that, you're going to have uh, an overturning of, you know, the world's largest market by independent developers that are located uh, all around the world. Um, and this will be entirely internet native. There will be, you know, no geogating to a lot of this stuff. And it'll, it'll interpact everything from traditional financial services to um, the value chain and supply chain and companies as we know them. Uh, and so this is just kind of like a section where we're just going to get into, you know, where are we right now? So, you know, if you kind of look at where we were in 2017 versus where we are right now, it, it's, it's almost unrecognizable. Um, 2017, a lot of pie in the sky aspirational projects, um, few of them really delivered, but today the ones that have made it and the ones that have stayed true to what they were trying to do and have made, you know, good use of their resources and community have evolved into this, you know, kind of stack. And, and you know, at the base layer sits your smart contract platform of choice, choice for us that happens to be Ethereum. You have data and tooling uh, with solutions like Chainlink and the Graph. And then you have stable coins, exchanges, AMM, sources of leverage, um, you know, sitting on top of that. And, and the result is there's just this highly composable, uh, you know, ecosystem of code and developers and community members, which can, you know, easily be forked, recreated. Um, and it's just like this incredible network effect where things like YAMs and things like Wi-Fi and things like Wi-Fi 2, 3, 4, 5 can be created in the span of hours and distributed globally and, and this is just the pace of the industry that we're in now you know michael and i joke that that we basically never sleep because we have to always be monitoring this stuff to see what's happening and, and to stay current with the industry but but it's very true the the pace of iteration in this industry has increased you know just gigantic in, in the past uh two or three years and and with this pace of innovation has brought a huge increase in dex volume you know if you look over a year ago uh, there was basically no DEX volume to be, to be spoken of. And today you're seeing DEXs take meaningful share of centralized exchanges and even more so take meaningful share of OTC desks. Uh, and this is really the start of, of this movement. Like at first, this is going to take spot exchange volume as you're seeing it do with the long tail of assets on, on Uniswap or uh, Bancor or uh, Synthetics. But then it'll move to more complex things. It'll move to 
uh, perpetual futures like McDex with Chain that Chainlink supports, uh, perpetual futures um, on synthetics which Chainlink supports, uh, you know, options in the future. And it'll just get more and more complex uh, until finally it'll feel odds to even trade on a centralized exchange. Um, and maybe that's a function of KYC or maybe that's a function of the user experience, but I think it just feels more natural for people to trade on index uh, than they will uh, on a centralized exchange given you know, wallets increasing to, to kind of get better. And so you know, these new primitives, um, whether it be staking and liquidity providing or voting and governance are highly composable. People are building projects and products with them extremely fast. And you know, of the things that we think of for the health of the industry, it's just how fast are things evolving? You know, how many developers are in this space? And, and with you know, this global movement, you know, whether it be the smartest developer in India or the smartest developer in China or in the US, you know, everybody has access to the same you know, code base and these primitives like Chainlink or Ethereum, uh, and they can just iterate extremely quickly. But you know, in this kind of chase for uh, pushing DeFi forward and, and continuing to kind of push the industry forward, you know, there's been you know some some stuff that's happened that hasn't been great. You know, there's been hacks on uh, oracles. There's been uh, smart contract bugs. There's been um, you know parts of collateral that have been put into our lend desk, which probably shouldn't have. But you know, that's to be expected. Um, not to make light of the user loss that that may have happened from that stuff, but you know, security and, and making sure that protocols are built with uh, user safety in mind has been something that's always been core to us. And as we talk to more and more projects, you know, doing things like rolling your own oracles or um, just, you know, doing things that are, uh, you know, messing with the lower level uh, implementation of a product really have, have become a no-fly zone. And, and so as a result of this, you see Chainlink uh, and the oracles that it has becoming the de facto security provider for DeFi. You know, we think of, of Chainlink um, from an opportunity standpoint as, you know, how much value is it securing? And, and whether that's on the total value lock side, like we're presenting here on this slide, or whether that's on, you know, exchanges that have implemented Chainlink oracles and Chainlink is securing the volume that's flowing through them. Uh, like on the Dodo side, uh, there's just a huge amount of, of use cases for Chainlink just as a security protocol. And so we really see teams, you know, now they start to develop and maybe a year it wasn't as clear, but, you know, they immediately have, you know, the idea of, you know, let's roll our own Oracle, but it's not that common anymore. People generally looked at Chainlink as their first and exclusive Oracle provider, not just because this is what the team does, you know, 24-7, 365, but also because it's a neutral platform uh, with incentives built in to keep the security at a high level. And so moving on <clears throat> to where this becomes much larger than we're talking about today, uh, we consider this to be where DeFi and the primitives that Vance discussed actually starts to move into the centralized finance or traditional finance world. Uh, and the you know, single digit billions of dollars that are locked in DeFi today actually becomes tens or hundreds of billions of dollars that we see flowing in, in even the smallest markets of traditional finance uh, every single day. Um, and, and we believe that this next phase of growth really comes from three main components uh, and we bucketize them as such uh, where we, we look at centralized lending for crypto assets and, and Genesis, BlockFi, and Nexo are, are really kind of the three standout providers there. Um, they will start to move in the direction of having their customers who are using crypto assets expect cryptographic secure uh, transactions in the same way that you would get by using a smart contract with the Chainlink Oracle uh, running on Ethereum. Uh, this, is, this transition, I think, is going to become uh, more noticeable over time, and, but it's just starting now, uh, now that more activity and interest is moving towards DeFi. Um, the other bucket that we look to is the non-crypto assets moving on chain, and this could come by way of synthetic assets that represent uh, global equities. This could come by way of Forex or commodities, uh, but it could be some simple things like mortgages or uh, loans or asset-backed securities that exist in an on-chain and off-chain realm that are traded on-chain. Um, and, and we're really excited about the opportunity there. Um, and then blockchain-enabled products are really a third class of initiatives where it, it's really only feasible to accomplish these product goals if you're doing this on chain. And the way that this would work is 
um, in the instance of Arbol, uh, being able to have weather insurance or crop insurance that's given out to people all over the world. And it's not able to be done in a centralized way just because it's too expensive to reach these people and it's too costly to uh, arbitrate these financial agreements. But when done on chain and distributed through, through the Ethereum network, it's very easy to accomplish this. Um, and so when we look at these three initiatives, and just using some back of the envelope math, comparing the size of DeFi today where, where it could be going in the future, the, the numbers are astounding. Um, today, we assume that there's about six to seven billion dollars of total value locked in DeFi. Uh, the number is thousands of times larger for even just single use products that are traded in traditional financial markets today. And the way that we get there, no, no, no guessing here is to be able to have tamper proof, high value data feeds that secure these financial contracts. And, and this is something that Sergey and team talk about frequently, um, but having a true permissionless tamper proof instance of an equity, a Forex or a commodity price or a price feed or, or a data feed for weather information enables us to continue to innovate in terms of where we're taking the financial primitives that we've been building over the last two years and the networks and the incentive models for use that we've been seeing over the last few months and enable them in new realms uh, with much higher value opportunities in, in the way that we're bridging CFI and DeFi. Um, and so we wanted to say thank you for, for the time um, and also that we will be announcing a couple of new nodes that we will be running, which will hopefully help transition DeFi into CeFi at a, at a faster rate.